morning, afternoon, and evening. <laughs> all speakers and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome to the SCNS webinar. The speaker for the first session today is our honorable guest from Brazil, Professor Guilherme uh, Ribas. Professor Ribas is one of the most famous uh, neurosurgeon of Brazil who is the master of neuroanatomy. He's a full professor of Albert Einstein School of Medicine as well as professor of neurosurgery at the University of Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil. He was appointed Professor of Clinical Neurosurgery at the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of Virginia, uh, United States of America. He has published landmark neuroanatomy papers in leading neurosurgery journals. He is an invited faculty to several workshops and conferences around the world. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinar and he'll be talking about anatomy-guided resection of intrinsic cerebral lesions. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from India, Professor Viji Ramesh. Professor Ramesh is the Professor of Neurosurgery and the Head of Department of Neurosurgery at the Chitinat Super Specialty Hospital and Research Institute of Chitinat Academy and of Research and Education, Chennai, India. He's also visiting professor at Tamil Nadu MGR Medical University. He was the former Professor of Neurosurgery at the Institute of Neurology, Madras Medical College, Chennai, where he was trained and mentored hundreds of Neurosurgical residents. We are extremely honored to have him uh, today at our webinar and he'll be talking about CSF Dynamic and MPH. The chair for the first session today webinar is our honored guest from Brazil, Professor Luis Boba. Professor Boba is a professor and chairman, Department of Neurosurgery, Evangelic uh, Medical School, Curitiba, Federal University of Paraná, Curitiba, Brazil. He's also the professor honoris causa, a C. Chenov. Medical School, Moscow, Russia Federation. He was the past president of Brazilian Neurosurgical Society. He's currently served as the chairman of the Education and Training Committee of the World Federation of Neurological uh, Society. He's also vice president of the well, as well as president of the elect of Latin American Federation of Neurosurgical Society. He was the president of World Skull Bay Society, upcoming meeting in Colombia, Bogota, Brazil in 2022. We are extremely uh, honored today for his presence in our webinar and we are sincere thank him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Ribas. The chair for second session today is our, of our webinar is our honorable guest from Japan, Professor Kiyoshi Tagaki. Professor Takagi is the director of Normal Pressure Hydrocephalus Center at the Abiko Senjinkai Hospital. He was a professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at the Fujita Health University, Japan. He's an important member of Japanese Neurosurgical Society. His research interests are focused upon the management of the cerebral vascular diseases, disorders of the cerebral spinal fluid, especially normal pressure hydrocephalus. He's also noted an uh, author with several publications in various peer review journals. We are extremely grateful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the second session of Professor V.G. Ramesh. On behalf of the Education Committee of the SNS and the President, Professor Yokokato, I would like to welcome both the speaker and the chair of, and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of SNS webinar. A warm welcome to our colleague in China and we're extremely thankful to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on WeChat channel. With that introduction, I will hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Luis Boba. Professor. Good morning, good morning, good evening for you, for, good night for someone. It's a great honor to me to introduce a legend in the study of the neuroanatomy dedicated to the neurosurgery. As you know, Professor Guilherme Rivas is a very well-known neurosurgeon and anatomist that are very recognized around the whole world. Years ago, when the people we start, they study the anatomy, especially the work of Professor Roto. One man came with the idea that you can make this better. And Professor Ribas was the first one to publish 3D picture of the brain and the neuroanatomy. I remember the June of neurosurgery, if all of you received, you have the glasses. It, you can, can, can see this beautiful work in June of neurosurgery. After Professor Ribas, Dr. Rotten started to do, uh, to organize and to do uh, 3D pictures. But the real man that start this uh, way of teach was Professor Rivas. Rivas is Brazilian, but he is very well known all the world. He worked in US also during many, many years. He has his own course in England, in Cambridge, and 
every year is going to around the world to give him these wonderful lectures. Thank you, Professor Hibas. Thank you to be with us. It will be a great honor to, to see you again and to watch your wonderful videos and presentation. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, please. Okay. Initially, I want to thank you all. Thank Professor Yoko, Professor Shu, Dr. Liu, Dr. Haja, who did get in touch with me, put this together. And thank my very good friend, uh, Luis Borba. Thanks for your kind words. And uh, I have the pleasure today to speak to you about how to use anatomy landmarks in neurosurgery. We all know that with the advent of microneurosurgery by Professor Yasagil, the suicide became not only the main landmarks of the cortical surface, but they became also possible microneurosurgical corridors for our practice. But the problem, as also we all know, is that the suicide are very difficult to be identified in surgery, not only because they are covered by arachnoid and by vessels, but mainly because most of them are interrupted and have some variability. Of course, nowadays we have technology, we have uh, the, the neural navigation systems and all this, but of course, technology cannot substitute of anatomical knowledge. And many times we don't have this available. Many times, many parts of the world, we don't have all this technology. And sometimes they just don't work or they are not uh, very well uh, detailed as uh, we would like. So we have to go back to anatomy and particularly to the relationships of the suicide and jare with the skull. That's what we're going to be talking about. Now, we have to understand this anatomy. And number one, historically, is very, very interesting that the organization of the brain soci and jari was described only 160 years ago by Louis-Pierre Graciolet, the way we know today. And we're going to be talking briefly about this also along our lecture. In order to understand the brain anatomy in the soci and jari particularly, we have initially to remember to have in mind that the soci were developed throughout an enfolding process towards the center while the brain was bending around the same center, which is the thalamus. And it's very interesting that this process that happened evolutionary, it's also repeated at least in its main steps throughout our embryology and fetal development. Very interesting this. So we have to have this in mind. Considering this process of unfolding process and remembering that the arachnoid envelopes the whole CNS as a big envelope, we have to understand the soci and the fissures of the brain as extensions of the subarachnoid space. Now, while just a few soci, like at least the posterior part of the superior temporal sulcus, at least the posterior part of the superior frontal sulcus and the sylvan fissure, of course, that which are continuous, most of the soci are interrupted. The inferior frontal soci, for example, that we're gonna be talking pretty much here, is constituted by two or three segments. And we have to understand then a soci, a sucus, a given sucus, like a, a, a concept and not a very well-defined subarachnoid space. The concept, the inferior frontal sulcus, for example, is the sum of these two or three segments here. So it's something very arbitrary. Now, when we come to the cortical surface, of course, they are continuous along the depth of the soci, but of course, they are also continuous along all the extremities of the soci. And considering this, we have to understand that the, uh, the brain jari constitute a continuum, constitute a continuum. The whole surface of the brain constitute a big continuum as being shown here in this beautiful MRI. For this reason, we have also to understand that a gyrus is an arbitrary region. We have to understand a gyrus, any given gyrus as a region. For example, the inferior frontal sulcus, gyrus that we're going to be talking pretty much here, is constituted by these three small convolutions here. These three small convolutions all together, they constitute what we call the concept of the inferior frontal gyrus. Now, given this process, this enfolding process that I talked about that 
happens throughout evolution, phylog uh, uh, phylogeny, and also to our embryological and fetal development. It's very interesting that the main soci of the superlateral surface of the brain and of the basal surface of the brain are always pointing to the nearest ventricular cavity. So this is important for us, for our practice, because if you're going along a main sucus, you are naturally going towards the nearest ventricular cavity. So this is a very good orientation for yourself, okay, as a surgeon. Now, this thing doesn't happen along the medial surface of the brain because the soci of the medial surface of the brain are parallel to the corpus callosum. They, their development is completely secondary in, in the, due to the development of the corpus callosum. Now, again, in the superlateral surface of the brain and in the basal surface of the brain, the main soci are always leading us towards the nearest, nearest ventricular cavity. This is very important for our orientation. You can see here, we did remove the middle frontal gyrus, and you can see the depth of the superior frontal sulcus and of the inferior frontal sulcus that it's taking us naturally to the ventricular cavity of the anterior horn of the ventricle here. Very important for our orientation. Due to the same process, it's very, very interesting that while the, 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 the main functional fibers, which are the projection fibers, they arise mostly from the crest of the gyri, the depth of the sucus is related pretty much only with the U fibers. So at least theoretically, if you go through a sucus, you're going to be putting the projection fibers apart. You're going to be damaging the U fibers, but at least you're going to be protecting more, damaging less the project, the more important functional projection fibers. This is another very important thing to have in mind when you're operating a patient. So now coming back to surgery, Paul Broca was the first one, was the father of the cranial cerebral topography issue, which is uh, one of the main chapters of neurosurgery, as you all know. Broca showed us that while the soci have some variations, not very much the main soci, they are pretty much continuous, but they still have some variation. There are some points that are, have a much more constant anatomy, particularly with the skull, with, with, with the skull convexity, with the, with, 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 with the skull surface, okay? And we, what we did, we did, re we did restudy these points, calling them microneurosurgical sulco key points. Okay, they are given by the extremities of important soci of the, like you can see here, of the central sulcus, and as meeting points of important soci. And as we're going to be seeing, they have a very much constant anatomy regarding not only the soci and gyri itself, but with the deep structures. And of course, as Broca had already shown, most of them with the skull surface. We did study the same points that so Broca and others have described, and some points that we did describe ourselves we're going to be talking about. I like also always to start with the so-called Sylvan point, which nowadays is called anterior Sylvan point because we have a posterior Sylvan point, because the anterior Sylvan point is pretty much a prototype of what I call, what I call a so-called key point. The so-called anterior sylvan point, again, because we have a posterior sylvan point as uh, named by Yasagil, the anterior sylvan point divides the sylvan fissure, which is the lateral sulcus of the brain, in an anterior part or sphenoidal part and a posterior part of lateral part. And from the anterior sylvan point, you always, always have a branch that goes up and anteriorly, which is the horizontal branch, and another branch, which is the anterior ascending branch, because you have a posterior ascending branch as well. These two branches, of course, they delineate what we call the pars triangularis, the triangular part, which is this convolution that has a very constant anatomy. Sometimes like looks like a new, sometimes like a triangle. Uh, and it's very interesting that you always have a small branch of the inferior frontal sucus that comes inside the triangular part, as we believe that we were the ones that described this. Anterior to the triangular part, you have the orbital part, and posteriorly, you have the opercular part. I'm going to be emphasizing here very, very many times this opercular part, which is called the beautiful U, the most beautiful U of the, of, 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 
of the human brain. Why? Because this beautiful U here is the most constant convolution of the brain. Always have this U-shaped, always have this U-shaped, very evident. Sometimes the base of the U is inside the fissure, but you always have this U-shaped. If you have a U-shape, it's because you have a sulcus inside here. And this sulcus is the pre-central sulcus. So it's much easier, as you're going to be seeing, to recognize initially the pre-central sulcus inside the pericular part, and then you, dis you, 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 you identify the central sulcus posteriorly. Well, anyway, these three... Convolutions, as I said, they constitute what we call the inferior frontal gyrus, okay? Here in the opercular region, of course, you have the superior temporal gyrus, and you have the central lobe with the precentral and postcentral gyrus we're going to be talking later. This anterior sylvan point is very evident in surgery, very evident in surgery. Why? Because you have what we call a cisternal aspect. The subarachnoid space is enlarged at this point. And why is it enlarged? It is enlarged because the pars triangularis, the triangular part, is always more retracted than the orbital and the U-shaped opercular part. So you always have an enlargement of the subarachnoid space here, and sometimes you have a huge lake, as you can see here. Okay. So given this, you can always identify this in surgery. And as Professor Yasajiu says, the more you know, the more you see. If you identify the anterior sylvan point, usually you can see the two small veins that are getting together and joining the superior sylvan vein. And you, once you in, identify this, you have the horizontal part, you have the anterior ascending part. Oh, and of course, you're seeing here the triangular part more retracted. Anterior to it, you have the orbital part, which is always bulging, is always more prominent. And posterior to the pars triangularis, you have the beautiful U. I'm not seeing very well, but the more I know, the more I see. I can see this is the beautiful U here, and I can see this is the precentral sign, the precentral sucus getting inside this U. And as I'm going to be pointing, it's very, very common to have a vein running particularly over the precentral sucus and the interparietal sucus and the postcentral sucus as well. You can see the small vein here. Okay. This is to remind me here, the, the anterior silver point, a point in anatomy is not a point in geometry. A point in anatomy is also a region. You have always to understand everything as a region. So you have a huge region here that we call anterior silver point. Why? Because the pars triangularis up here is very much retracted. It's very small. And you can see the beautiful U here of the pars opercularis with the precentral sulcus. So this is central sulcus. This is precentral. Always this beautiful U here. But at this point, I want to point that just underneath the anterior silver point, we have the apex of the insula. We always have the apex of the insula. And The short gyri arise, we're not talking about this, but all the short gyri of the insula arise from the apex of the insula, while the long gyri do not arise from the apex of the insula. And just underneath the apex of the insula, you have two very important fiber tracts, anteriorly the uncinate tract and posterior the IFOF, inferior frontal occipital fascicle related with semantic aspects of language, as you know. So just underneath the anterior sylvan point in the apex of the insula, you have this very more, is very important tract. This is very, very anatomically constant. So when you open widely the sylvan fissure, you know that underneath the anterior sylvan point, you have the region of the apex of the insula. Sometimes the apex is pretty much flat. It's not very evident. But you know that at this point, you're going to be having the uncinate fascicle running here and the i just posterior to it. Very constant anatomical relationship. Now, regarding to the skull, where is the anterior sylvan point? Again, another specimen, a beautiful you here, Pars opercularis, precentral sulcus, central sulcus. An anterior sylvan point, an enlargement of the subarachnoid space. Anterior sylvan point lights exactly underneath the anterior aspect of the squamous suture that you can see here. This is not squamous suture. This is sphenoid temporal suture here. Squamous sutures begin just behind what we call the pterium, which is this region that you already know pretty much about it. This is where the anterior sylvan point is. Let's see how important, how much the sylvan point can help us in surgery, okay? And how much this anatomical knowledge can help you. 
You can see here, unfortunately, a head and neck surgeon from the north of our country. We came with this region. You would say, this is a frontal region. This is a percular region. But just like seeing, I'm going to Europe. Where in Europe are you going to? You have to be very specific. You're doing microneurosurgery. So we have to study the anatomy of the tumor very, very much. Let's understand more this tumor. You see that this tumor is subcortical, okay? And it's pretty much over the anterior aspect of the insula. That's where this, 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 this lesion is. Now, if you come from inside out, you're going to be seeing that this lesion is inside the pars triangularis. Why? You see here the beautiful U. You see here the beautiful U. So this is the pars opercularis. This is the precentral sucus. So this is pars triangularis here, okay? And the, our tumor is exactly inside the pars triangularis. And yes, you have to know from anatomy that if you remove selectively the pars triangularis, very well retracted here, this is all anterior serum point region. The beautiful U is inside the fissure here. But if you remove the pars triangularis, you're going to be exposing the anterior, most anterior short, most anterior short gyros of the insula, just as we saw in the MRI. So you know that your lesion is exactly inside the pars triangularis, okay? Nowadays, you can go to the radiological suite and study the soci and gyri anatomy you're going to be finding tomorrow in your surgery. Again, the beautiful U and the precentral sucus here, okay? So you can go to surgery. The more you know, the more you see, okay? You see here, of course, the sylvan fissure, and you see here an area of enlargement of the sylvan fissure. All this region is the anterior sylvan point. Okay, so you can identify the pars triangularis more retracted here. You can see the small branch of the inferior frontal sucus that is coming inside from anterior to inferior inside the pars triangularis as we described. You know, you're never going to see the inferior frontal sucus completely because inferior frontal sucus is a concept of two or three segments. So you're going to be seeing some segments of the inferior frontal sucus, but not as a whole, the inferior frontal sucus. But you can identify very well the pars triangularis, okay? If you open the horizontal branch of the sylvan fissure and the anterior ascending branch and remove selectively the pars triangularis, we did use the neural navigation system here, but I'm trying to show that if you don't have it, if it doesn't work, you know where the lesion is, you identify the pars triangularis, you remove the pars triangularis, and the tumor is exactly where you thought it was, inside the pars triangularis, just underneath the pars triangularis. And you can do a beautiful resection just by understanding the anatomy of the anterior sewing point. Okay, and you can see that you did remove selectively the pars triangularis. You see the beautiful U here, pars opercularis is here, this is precentral sucus. Okay, so anatomy can help you very, very much. Well, posteriorly to the inferior frontal gyrus, you have what Yasagil calls the central lobe, which is the precentral gyrus and the postcentral gyrus. The precentral gyrus. It's always an interrupted gyrus, okay, that ends inferiorly inside the pars opercularis because you always have this superficial connection of the middle frontal gyrus with the precentral gyrus. So in precentral sucus has an inferior part and a superior part. Postcentral gyrus can be continuous, but sometimes it's also interrupted by a connection we'll be talking about later. The precentral sucus, precentral gyrus, and the postcentral gyrus are united, connected inferiorly by the subcentral gyrus and superiorly by the paracentral lobule. So the so-called central lobe, okay, is just like an ellipse that it's connected inferiorly by the subcentral gyrus and superiorly by the paracentral lobule. Okay, as you can see here, the paracentral lobule on the other side, and it's excavated by the central sucus, with most of the time, 90, 80%, something like that, as showed by Ono, is a continuous sucus, but it can also be an interrupted sucus. So the so-called central gyrus is an ellipse excavated by the central sucus. When you go to, comes to lateral surgery, you always try to see MRIs in T1 
they are have a, have a more defined anatomy, okay? And always see very well lateral cuts when you see in the sagittals. And always identify the beautiful you here, the beautiful you here with the precentral sucus and here small parts triangularis. The more you know, the more you see. But at this point, I want to emphasize that the so-called central lobe I'm talking about looks quadrangular, looks quadrangular in the MRI. And of course, with the central sucus inside and the subcentral gyrus just connecting the precentral and the postcentral gyrus. Very well defined on that. When you look to this upper surface of the temporal lobe, which is called usually uh, the, 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 opercular, the opercular part, the opercular surface of the temporal lobe, you can see a very well-defined transverse gyrus. We call transverse gyrus all gyri that inside are inside soci and fissures. So it turns out that this is our the biggest transverse gyrus we have. Of course, this is the transverse gyrus of Heschel. Sometimes you have a double transverse gyrus. Sometimes you have just one. It's very, very evident, and it's always leading us to the atrium, always going towards the atrium. The Heschel gyrus is part of the superior temporal gyrus. This is all superior temporal gyrus here. So it's a transverse gyrus inside the fissure that it's part of the superior temporal gyrus, which covers the interior, inferior half of the insula and constitutes the temporal operculum. But what I want to emphasize at this point is that the uh, Heschel gyrus divides the, uh, the, 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 this opercular surface, the superior surface of the temporal lobe in two very evident uh, planes. One which is oblique, which is the polar plane because it's just next to the temporal pole. And another one that is very flat, always triangular, that we call the temporal plane. Okay, the temporal plane. So very evident. Heschel gyrus divide this. So this is flat, this is oblique. So let's use anatomy to see MRIs. You have to see everything anatomically. You have to look at MRIs anatomically, to the head of your patient anatomically, and of course, to the surgery anatomically. But if you look to a coronal here, you see it oblique, okay? If you see it oblique, it's because you are anterior to the Heschel gyrus. If you see it flat, it's because you are at the Heschel gyrus or posterior to it. So just by knowing this, you have to know that this divides the fissure. Coming back to this, we're going to be seeing that both central gyrus is sitting here and supramarginal gyrus is sitting here. So when you see this, you can see that this piece of brain has to be or the post central gyrus or the supramarginal gyrus. We're going to be returning to this. But just by seeing this, you have to know where you are along the fissure, if you are anterior or posterior to the Heschel gyrus. Another very, 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 very important feature of the Heschel gyrus is that along the border of the cilm fissure here, the Heschel gyrus always have this prominence, always is this pumping here, always has this prominence here. You see the Heschel gyrus here, just posterior to the insula going towards the atrium and gets very near to the atrium. When it comes to the lateral surface here, just at the edge along the cilm fissure, you have this very, very, very evident prominence. And as I mentioned, the post-central gyrus, post-central gyrus is always sitting in the Heschel gyrus. This was shown by Wynn, a very important Brazilian neurosurgeon who spent many years with Dr. Rodden here. He showed that post-central gyrus is always sitting over the Heschel gyrus. Let's see if this is true. Pars triangularis, the beautiful U, this is pre-central sucus, this is central sucus, so this is pre-central gyrus. And this is post-central gyrus, and post-central gyrus always sitting in the Heschel gyrus. Very, very constant anatomical feature. And that's how the, 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 the neuroradiologists identify the Heschel gyrus. They see this prominence, okay, and they identify the Heschel gyrus in the, in the, in the axial, okay? And you can, I see the Heschel gyrus, I can, if I see a cavernoma here, I'm going to say the cavernoma is in the post-central gyrus. I don't have to see anything else. Why? Because the post-central gyrus is always sitting in the Heschel gyrus, okay? So this is central, central sucus, this is pre-central sucus. This is too deep, I'm not seeing the, 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 the beautiful you here, okay? Anatomy, okay. Always think anatomy and always study anatomy. When you see an MRI, see the normal part. Remember the beautiful you with the pre-central sucus here. Remember the quadrangular aspect of the central lobe, a big central sucus. Here, this is subcentral gyrus. 
Oh, look at the pump, the prominence here of the Hesho Jarus with the post central Jarus always sitting here. It's everything always there. Okay. And the supramarginal Jarus posteriorly, as we're going to be seeing. So you can see a tumor here. Okay. Sitting in the posterior part of the sylvan fissure. You can see the beautiful U. You can see this is pre central Jarus. So this is a post central Jarus. You can see the supramarginal Jarus is pretty much evident here also. So this is a post-central gyrus tumor that enlarged the post-central gyrus and it's sitting in the temporal plane. You know that the post-central gyrus and the supramarginal gyrus posteriorly are sitting in the temporal plane. So when you look in the coronal, of course, this tumor is going to be sitting in the flat aspect of the sylvan fissure, of course. So just by looking at this MRI, I know that this tumor is either in the post, the base of the post-central gyrus or in the anterior part of supramarginal gyrus, just by seeing the single cut, because I'm seeing that it's sitting in the flat aspect of the sylvan fish. Now, let's continue with this operculum we're talking about. There are, we talk about the anterior sylvan point, but there are two other key points very important. One is where the concept of inferior frontal sucus, you can see here all these segments, when it meets the precentral sulcus that it's sending the beautiful U, it's a very important key point. When you have this meeting points, you usually have an enlargement of the subarachnoid space. This point is very important because it's showing us the top of the pars operculares. The precentral gyrus from here inferiorly is the face and, 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 and oropharyngeal representation, so has a bilateral representation. So at least in the right side, in low dominant hemisphere, you can pretty much remove all this frontal operculum, okay? So this is an important key point. Another very important key point is where the central sucus would project in the fissure, what we call the inferior landing point. Of course, you have the subcentral gyrus here, but central sucus would project in the fissure right here, just anterior to the hesial gyrus. You see here, now you recognize always, you see this prominence? This is, of course, the uh, the hesial gyrus, okay? And of course, the post-central gyrus is sitting in the hesial gyrus, sitting. Pre-central sulcus, central sulcus, post-central gyrus, sitting in the hesial gyrus, always there. Now, the meeting point of the inferior frontal sulcus with the pre-central sulcus is just posterior to what Broca called the stephanium. The stephanium is the meeting point of the coronal suture with the superficial temporal line. Just posterior to it, you have this meeting point, very important. And where is the inferior landing point? Inferior landing point is the upper aspect of the squamous suture, upper aspect in, 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 a, in a perpendicular line that comes from what we call the pre, pre auricular depression, where you can palpate your temporal pulse. I'm going to return to this briefly. Okay. So let's see how much we can take from the squamous suture. Let's operate on that patient that has, let's operate on this patient here that has the post central gyrus glioblastoma, okay? So we know this is in the post central gyrus. So let's see how much we can see through the squamous suture, okay? Well, let me just come back here. What I'm calling the pre-central, the pre-central depression is this, this area, just, just where you can palpate in front of your tragus, where you can palpate your temporal pulse. If you come four centimeters from this preauricular depression right here, if you come four centimeters in the adult, you're going to be at the highest aspect of the squamous suture. And that's where your inferior landing point is. So again, you have the preauricular depression there where you can feel temporal pulse just in front of your tragus. If you come four centimeters up, you are at the upper aspect of the squamous suture. This is where the inferior landing point is with project. So the central sucus is going to be here. Okay. And you know, you have to know that the anterior part of the squamous suture runs pretty much along over the anterior part of the sylvan fissure. When it comes from here, from this point, the sylvan fissure goes up and the squamous fissure goes down. Now, this is inferior rolandic point. Okay. So, just two, 2.5 centimeters, less than three centimeters anterior, you have the anterior sylvan point. So you're going to have the pars triangularis here. 
You have the pars operculares here. You have the central sucus here. You have the precentral gyrus here. Okay, and what do you have posterior to the inferior landing point? What do you have here? You have the hachial gyrus here. You have the always you have the hachial gyrus here, and of course you have the postcentral gyrus sitting here. You can see the whole operculum just by looking, and of course you have the superior temporal gyrus, which is the temporal operculum running just underneath the sylvan fissure. Inferior to the to the to the squamous suture. Okay, so you can see the whole frontal temporal operculum just by looking at the squamous fissure. Okay, so you open, you know that this is in the post central gyrus. So this is inferior landing point. This is inferior landing point. This is central sulcus. So this is pre central gyrus. Okay, this is inferior landing point. Okay, where the central sulcus is projecting the sylvan fissure. Of course, you're seeing the sylvan fissure here. Of course, you're seeing the sylvan fissure here. If you go more anteriorly, you're seeing the anterior sylvan point. So you can see the pars triangularis up here, more retracted. And the more you know, the more you see. You can see the pars opercularis, the beautiful you. This is another patient. You can see you have a vein running here over the precentral sulcus. Almost always you find this vein here, but you can see the beautiful you of the pars opercularis here, okay? And you know that all this region here, this is precentral gyrus. Always understand a gyrus as a region, as an arbitrary region, okay? And now, if you lift this dural edge here, you're going to see another cystenoid space, an enlargement of the, of the subarachnoid space. That's where the inferior frontal sulcus is meeting the precentral sulcus that is ending in the beautiful U with the vein I talked about, okay? So this is the top of the pars opercularis here, okay? The precentral gyrus from here inferiorly is pretty much just face or facial representation, okay? So you can see through the squamous fissure, we seeing the anterior sylvan point, if you, you can recognize anatomically the whole, the whole, uh, the whole uh, uh, operculum. Of course, you're going to use brain mapping, you're going to use everything, but you have to know anatomy. You have to know geography to understand history, okay? All right. So you can debug this patient, was an old lady, and here I'm using the slow side as landmarks, as references, okay? And she did fine, left side, she was still speaking. All right. We saw the frontal operculum, we saw the central lobe. Let's see the parietal lobe. We know that the superior temporal gyrus is the superior... It's the, the, the temporal operculum. We know the middle and the inferior temporal gyrus. I'm not talking about the basics anatomy to you. But in the, in the, in the parietal region, you can see a very well-defined sulcus, which is the intraparietal sulcus. Okay, intraparietal sulcus. Intraparietal sulcus is pretty much always continuous with this inferior part of the postcentral gyrus. And of course, superior, you have the superior parietal lobule, and inferior, you have the inferior parietal lobule that it's constituted by the supramarginal and the angular gyrus. Okay, now, the sylvan fissure, lateral sulcus of the brain, always ends inside the supramarginal gyrus, always ends inside the supramarginal gyrus along this posterior ascending branch and terminal branch. Sometimes you have a descending branch that it's not always there, but always ends inside the supramarginal gyrus. And the supramarginal gyrus is always, always continuous with the superior temporal gyrus, always continuous with the superior temporal gyrus. Now, from this intraparietal sulcus, usually you have a sulcus that is separating the supramarginal from the angular which is called the intermediary sulcus of, the, of, of Jensen. Now, when you come along the superior temporal sulcus, that usually is continuous, at least this posterior part, here you have a very small uh, interruption. Uh, the, inferior, the, the superior temporal sulcus, very deep, very deep and very constant, always ends posterior to the posterior sylvan point. This is posterior sylvan point. And has a distal branch that always gets inside the angular gyrus, always gets inside the angular gyrus. And then you have a superior branch that corresponds also to the intermediary sulcus. Here is the same branch that comes from the intraparietal and comes from the end of the superior temporal. If you have an interruption here, it's because you're going to have a connection between the supramarginal and the angular. So this piece of brain here, 
I will say that it belongs to the supramarginal or not to the angular. You see that it continues with the superior temporal. Anatomy is definition. So for definition, this is part of the supramarginal, and this is angular. Angular, you see like a, a beautiful horseshoe shape here, but usually it doesn't have this horseshoe shape as you see in our books. Usually it's very well, not very well defined. So again, you have to understand the angular gyrus as a region, the region of the angular gyrus. And the anatomy is organized here such that the superior temporal gyrus always continues with the supramarginal. Middle temporal gyrus always continues with the angular. And inferior temporal gyrus always continues with inferior occipital gyrus, what we're going to be talking later. The inferior temporal gyrus, occipital, continues with inferior temporal. Okay? All right. If you come to MRI, you see the beautiful quadrangular aspect of the central lobe, and you can see the supramarginal continue with the, the superior temporal. Okay? You can see the middle occipital gyrus going to the angular region. And you can... This is the end of here of, 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 of the superior temporal sucus. This is intermediary sucus of the Jensen, separating the supramarginal from the angular gyrus. If we have a more lateral, I, I bet we, going, we, 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 we would have a branch sucus seen here because it's always there, okay? And it, the superior temporal sucus is continuous here. You would have this continuation that is there more lateral. It's very deep, not, it's very shallow here. And it ends inside the angular gyrus. So this is angular gyrus. This is angular gyrus. And this is all supramarginal. And inferior temporal continues with inferior occipital. Always there. In the parietal region, I want to talk about uh, uh, two important points. One is very easy, which is the aerium. You have a frontal bossa, an occipital bossa, and a parietal bossa which is also called parietal tuberosity. The center of it is the aerium, is the more prominent aspect of the parietal bossa, okay? Aerium. And the aerium that is very easy to palpate in your heads, you just come from the back of your mastoid tip and you go vertically here. When you find the most superior aspect of your parietal bossa, you can feel the aerium palpating yourselves. The aerium is always, always, always over the superior aspect of the supramarginal gyrus. So this is superior marginal gyrus, continues with the superior temporal here, always. And you see that it's the most prominent part because it's underneath the most prominent parietal bossa, okay? The other point is where the intraparietal sucus is continuous with the postcentral sucus, always continuous here. Okay, so this is a transition point that is just posterior to the postcentral gyrus. And the postcentral gyrus is going to be sitting here in the hashal gyrus. Okay, this is precentral gyrus, this is central sucus. Where is this point? This point, all points I'm talking about have a variability of less than one centimeter. Okay, the error. This has a little bit more, but less than two centimeters, because the interparietal sucus can be longitudinal here, can be more oblique and can be a little bit more far away from the interhemispheric fissure. But this point is pretty much constant anatomically. It's six centimeters from the lambda and five centimeters from the, from, from the, from the midline, okay? So you can palpate, uh, you, I, I forgot to tell you that uh, the, the, the bregma is 13 centimeters from the nasium, and the lambda is more 13 centimeters from the bregma in the edo. This is an average, okay? So if you palpate the lambda, or if you see the lambda, which is about 26 centimeters from the nasium, six centimeters anterior and five, five centimeters lateral, you are over this anterior aspect, uh, of, of over this part where it's covering this transition point here. And you see that the aerium is more lateral because the aerium is in the supramarginal gyrus, okay? The aerium, it's going to be here, okay? The anterior part of the supramarginal gyrus. So it's more anterior and more lateral. It's right here. So you have to have this in mind. You have to study the so-called key points to have this map in your heads, okay? So Please tell me when I have more two or three minutes and uh, I'll just finish uh, if you want, okay? So st 
part always in the normal side. You can see a sucus here. It has to be the intraparietal. There's no other sucus that is longitudinal in the parietal region. So, and you know that the intraparietal is continuing with the postcentral. So this is postcentral. So this is supramarginal. This is angular. This is postcentral gyrus. This is precentral gyrus. Just by identifying here, I'm identifying everything. So if I have a cavernoma here, I can say this cavernoma is at the top of the supramarginal gyrus. If the cavernoma is here, it's in the angular gyrus. So I'm seeing a tumor that is in the inferior parietal lobule. And if I see more carefully, I can see that the angular gyrus, which is continuous with the middle temporal gyrus here, this is, this is the angular gyrus region. This is the angular gyrus region, okay? And this is the middle temporal gyrus. This is superior temporal gyrus. I can say that this tumor, this is low-grade tumor, is in the supramarginal gyrus. Again, as Professor Yasajo emphasizes, this tumor remains in compartments for a long time. So knowing this, I know that this tumor probably is not infiltrating the angular gyrus. And supramarginal gyrus, so this is post-central, this is pre-central, this is the quadrangular shape of the central lobe, okay? So this is where my patient is. And I always say, let's operate a glioma as we operate a meningioma, a shivanoma. Let's operate it anatomically, at least identifying where we are. So what I wanna do here, I wanna expose the end of the fissure because I'm gonna be cutting this. If you, if you come back here, you see that the tumor is not reaching the superior temporal gyrus. You have to understand very, very precisely the anatomy of the tumor, okay? So I'm going to be cutting this connection here from the end of the fissure, which is right here, from the end of the fissure, posterior silver point, here to the Jensen, to the intermediary sucus of Jensen, where I'm going to be opening. And I'm going to be cutting this. Then I'm going to open the intraparietal sucus and going along the postcentral sucus. And I'm going to remove the region of the supramarginal right, uh, gyrus. Sometimes you don't have to be transsucus, I'm not going to be doing here. Sometimes I go supio, sometimes I debulk the tumor, it depends, okay? But you have to know where you are and you have to use your suicide and your key points as landmarks. So you see the aerium here, the most prominent aspect of the parietal bossa comes just from the back of your mastoid tip. So this is the posterior part of the of the supramarginal gyrus. So I know that my tumor is right here. If you like small incisions, just do a small incision here. You're going to be over the tumor. Don't need your navigation because this point is over the supramarginal gyrus where the tumor is. This point is the transition of the intraparietal to the postcentral, okay, which I did put more lateral because of the swelling. This is the inferior lunate point. Where is the of the, 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 the pre-auricular depression, I can palpate my pulse, four centimeters up, I'm in the inferior landing point. So the end of the fissure is going to be posterior here, and here is going to be the connection of the superior temporal gyrus with the supramarginal gyrus where the tumor is. Upper aspect of the parietal bossa, parietal tubercle, okay, tuberosity, I'm sorry. So this is the aerium. My tumor is right here because here underneath is the, the, the supramarginal gyrus, and here it is. Intraparietal sucus always, most of the time, harbors a vein, as you can see here. Most of the time harbors a vein. You see the end of the fissure here, okay? And I'm going to open, I, I find a sucus here. I try to start what is more difficult before. Okay, the intermediary sucus is a little bit more difficult. Okay, so I see that there is a sucus here. It has to be the intermediary sucus. So this is angular region, angular gyrus region. This is all supramarginal where the tumor is, and this is the end of the fissure. So at this point here, I did open already the intermediary sucus, and I'm exposing the end of the fissure here, exposing the end of it. So this is the connection between the superior temporal gyrus and the supramarginal gyrus where the tumor is. So I'm going to be cutting this here until the intermediary sucus because I'm going to remove this meningioma here, okay? Now I start opening the interparietal sucus. You see how deep the interparietal sucus here? And I spare this vein, of course. The more you practice, the more you know, okay? So you see here how deep it is. If I go along the interparietal sucus, and I know that the sucus is underneath the vein, I'm going towards the postcentral sucus, which is the anterior limit of my tumor. I studied the tumor anatomy. I want to go to the postcentral sucus. 
So I did an anatomical resection of the supramarginal gyrus, as you can see here. And now I can see more beautifully the central lobe here, and I can see the beautiful U here, okay? All right, if you go anterior, now dorsally, if you go superiorly, you can see the superior frontal sutures. Very big avenue for us, very big avenue. Always evident, always deep. It's continuous at least in its two posterior two thirds, usually it's continuous. This is a very variable sucus that it's the frontal, the frontal medial sucus. But this is the one that's about two, two point something centimeters from the midline. The superior frontal sulcus always ends at the precentral sulcus. And you see here the connection of the middle frontal gyrus with the precentral that divides the precentral sulcus in an inferior part and a superior part. Okay. And you have here the beautiful U. This is another beautiful U, the second beautiful U of the brain, which is the paracentral lobule. And this is the this is the paracentral. So this is the central sulcus. You have the ellipse of the central lobe here. And it turns out that this superior frontal sulcus always ends here at the omega region, always at the omega region where you control your hand in the other side. This is a compartment where you have all, a lot of tumors, particularly SMA tumors, where are the posterior and medial aspect of the superior frontal gyrus. So this is a very important key point where the superior frontal sulcus meets the precentral sulcus. Another specimen, you have a beautiful omega here. That's where you have your hand control. And you have another superior frontal sulcus, in this case, very much continuous and very deep. This point, very important, because you're going to be reaching the ventricle. It's this lateral limit of all this SMA area and superior frontal gyrus tumor, where you have a lot of tumors. And you don't want to go behind here because you don't want to, don't want to get inside the omega. This point is three centimeters from midline. You have the bragma here. And 1.5, 1.5, 2 centimeters, not more, less than 2, 2 centimeters from the coronal suture. That's where this point is. Let's operate this tumor. You, you would agree that this tumor is in the superior frontal gyrus. Most of you, you could say that it's in the cingulate as well. Let's see. And you don't know about the middle frontal gyrus here, but understand the anatomy of the tumor. Okay. So, this is what I'm going to be doing, this anatomical removal of the superior frontal gyrus, okay? I have here my coronal suture. I know that the point I'm talking about is 2 centimeters posterior, 1.5, and 3 centimeters off midline, okay? I don't want to go post more posterior here because I know precentral gyrus will be here. So I want to remove this. The more you know, the more you see. I can see a soup. Well, number one, expose the midline. In these tumors, if you're afraid of the sinus, superior sagittal sinus, and you leave a little bit of bone here, you're going to be covering at almost half of your tumor. So you don't want to do this. You want to operate just like you're going to be doing an aneurysm. You want to expose the natural spaces, okay? So you expose the interhemispheric fissure, and you can see a sulcus here. Of course, this is the central sulcus. I know, I studied it. This is central sulcus. And I can see my vein here over the precentral sulcus, very, very common. Of course, use your nerve navigation, use your nerve navigation. But at this point, I open the superior frontal sulcus very deep. Okay, that's what I'm opening here. Okay, and now I'm looking at the midline. I'm reaching the, the corpus callosum and I see the cingulate. The cingulate gyrus looks good. I have to see everything, just like an aneurysm, just like a shivanoma of the acoustic. You have to see everything. This is neurosurgery, just, just as any other lesion. And in this case, I was able to open the cingulate sucus, able to open. Sometimes you don't do it. The more you do, the more you will do it. But you can go supio, but you have to know where you are. In this case, I see the cingulate gyrus have no tumor. Yasagi was right again. The tumor is, is inside this big compartment, which is the superior frontal gyrus that was removed anatomically here, preserving the singular gyrus. This is an enhanced MRI. The first day after the surgery, you can see no tumor in the middle frontal gyrus that came back to its place, just like the single A. Anatomical surgery. Anatomical surgery. Okay. Superior rolandic point, Broca showed us that it's five centimeters posterior to the bregma. Remember that the bregma is 13, 12 to 14, 13 centimeters average in the adult from the nasion up here, and you have the bregma. Five centimeters, you have the superior rolandic point. 
Superior aspect of the squamous suture, you have the inferior landing point. Say central sulcus is here. You always have to know where the central sulcus is, of course. So this is a tumor. You have the beautiful U of the paracentral lobule here. This is terminal aspect of the of the of the cingulate uh, sulcus here. Okay, and this is central sulcus. So we know that our tumor is in the post central sulcus. This patient was being followed, and then it started to enhance, and uh, that's what we wanted to remove. Okay, you see the beautiful U. This is another specimen here. And uh, five centimeters, we want to know where it is. Because if we know where it is, we know that our tumor is sitting right here. We know central sulcus will be here. Our tumor is right here. Just by knowing the inferior landing point, you know where the sulcus is, okay? So you expose everything. Use, you do use your nerve navigation. Do use. But sometimes you go, you're going to be correcting the nerve navigation. Do use brain mapping. Anatomy does not show function. Usually, function is where you sort of expect, but it can vary. So use your brain mapping in eloquent areas, of course, okay? Now, in this case, I was open. I, I did open the central sulcus, which you can do very carefully if you don't coagulate any vessel. And then you find a plane around the tumor, and you can remove or can debulk your tumor. And this patient did fine. Let me just come back here. You see this vein here? This vein was not exactly over the central sulcus. Veins there are pre-central, intraparietal uh, intra uh, are the ones that are more constant uh, along the sulci. Central vein sometimes is not exactly over the central sulcus. Okay, and you have a good resection. She did fine, and she did for 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 five, almost five years, and she always uh, she always, she had a baby in between. It was a GBM. And she was a very brave woman, and I always, I, I always want to honor her when I give this lecture here. Okay, when we come to this posterior part of the brain, okay, we can see very well a fissure here. We can see very well a big fissure here. Let's see what is this fissure here, okay? If you come to the midline, you remember this is calcan fissure, and you remember that this is parieto, parieto occipital sucus or parietoxipto fissure also, because it's very deep. And so this is the cuneus, this is the precuneus. This is very deep. This is very deep. So what is this fissure here? This fissure is exactly the depth of parietoxipto sucus. So we nowadays we call this parietoxipto incisure, parietoxipto incisure. And you have here the parietoxipto connection of graciolet, which was called by Broca. You always have this other beautiful U here, always. So this is the depth of the parieto occipital sulcus, okay? And where is this point? Where is this point? The superior aspect of the parieto occipital sulcus, which is the medial aspect of the parieto occipital incisure. Broca showed that this point is exactly at the angle that there is between the sagittal suture and the lambda suture. No error, no half centimeter error is exactly here, one side and the other side. Another point I want to point out is the opistocranium. Palpate the back of your head, the most prominent point of your parietal bossa, the most prominent point of the back of your head is the opistocranium. Opistocranium means the far away, the most far away. And of course, it's showing underneath it the end of the calcan fissure, the calcan fissure. We did develop very much our vision as mammals, okay? So of course, this has to be the most prominent aspect of the back of your brain and the back of your head. So the calcan fissure ends here underneath the opistocranium. The ineum sometimes is difficult to palpate, but the opistocranium is easy because it's the most prominent part of your back. So let's operate this GBM. This lady had had a temporal GBM that was removed after two years, more or less. She came with this uh, uh, right amyanopsia, and she had this tumor here that, in my understanding, was taking the middle occipital gyrus. I'm not talking about circuit anatomy today. This is middle occipital gyrus. This is where the tumor is running. But it's taking both the cuneus and the lingual gyrus. It's taking both the cuneus. In this case, I'm doing an occipt anatomical occipital lobectomy if I want to remove this lesion. If you get inside here to the bulk, you're going to find tumor mixed with brain. So you have to know where you are. So I'm going to be opening this incisure, opening the parietoxipto sucus, 
cutting the parieto occipital uh, uh, connection here and comes until the tentorium and going to remove the whole occipital pole. So here you have the lambda. So if you see the lambda is because you are at the top of parieto occipital sulcus. Here you have the opistocranium, the most prominent. So you know where you are the calcan fissure. And here you have the inion. So it's where you have the tentorium. So I here I have the cuneus and I here I have the lingual gyrus. So I'm going to remove this piece of brain here, okay? So I see this, I see a vein, very common to see a vein over the suicide, okay? And when you open this, you can see the depth of the paratoxiptal gyrus, sucus, paratoxiptal sucus. And you can see the paratoxiptal connection of Graciole here. You're going to be cutting this and coming to the superior occiptal sucus here or interoccipital sucus, the same one. When you cut this and come down, you're going to be removing the whole occipital pole. You can see here the cuneus, you can see here the lingual gyrus, and you can see the anterior aspect of the lingual gyrus here. You can see here, and I'm lifting the precuneus with my bipolar. You have to know where you are. And I did a very nice resection of the occipital pole. Well, uh, I always like to give this lecture after an anatomy lecture, but I'm supposing that you know most of this basic anatomy I'm talking about. And uh, in this lecture, I didn't want to teach anybody to lecture, how to, to lecture, uh, how to operate. I just want to show how you can use landmarks. I, and I emphasize that you did study, do we study your landmarks. I'm not going to be showing this case for the sake of time, but I want to just end with, uh, with a brief... Uh, uh, presentation of our book where you can find all this landmarks and everything that I tried to study and learn with my mentor and friend Evandro and Dr. Rotten and Yasagil and everybody. I tried to put uh, uh, the anatomical uh, tips in this book. And again, thank you very much for your uh, your attention and for the invitation. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Professor. Professor Boba, uh, your main professor. I think Professor Hibble could talk more three or four hours. The wonderful uh, and this correlation, see, this makes the difference. You go from the anatomy to the surgery, and does this per perfect correlation. This is the work of Professor Evandro. Did during many many years, the correlation of anatomy, and the case, and the surgery. This. But I want to ask you something, uh, Dr. Ribas. Today there is a lot of things about neurophysiology. The papers, the people that are doing uh, uh, glioma surgery, interoperative monitoring, and they're forgetting a little bit the anatomy. What your opinion about this? You are leaving the anatomy back and just in the neurophysiology one, you, or one is complement of the other one. See, there is no, co no competition in your opinion. See, one is a, is a complementary. What is your opinion, Professor? Yes, this is a big issue that I think is still ongoing, you know. I think it's a moving target. I think, uh, number one, as I said, uh, to know history, you have to know geography. To understand history, you have to know geography. So to understand function, you have to know anatomy. So it comes before anyway. And as I said, functions can vary, but they are there. They are there. Okay. So I think brain mapping, you know, this thing, this is very welcome. This is very welcome. But we're going to be learning very much from this. And maybe in the future, we will have technology that will show this anatomically. Uh, what is uh, behind your question is about awake surgery, for example, and about uh, fiber tracts. I believe in big fiber tracts. When we go, when we start to talking about function of very small tracts, I have doubt because I, you don't know if you're stimulating this is the function of exactly that tract. So that's why I'm saying this is ongoing. We're gonna still learn more about this. But of course, we have to understand the brain. What we 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 want to preserve is the function, not the anatomy. We want to preserve the function. So this is welcome, but uh, I think it's ongoing. Sometimes some things is still gonna change. And what I see thinking anatomically is that usually function is where we expect it to be. And the plasticity, the people talk about the plasticity, uh, uh, 
to don't give radiation for low grade glioma because it changes the plasticity of the brain. This is what your yeah. opinion about that? Again, I'm, I'm when I when I'm seeing papers or in uh, discussions, I try to be humble in the in the sense that I think we don't know almost anything about the brain yet. We know the anatomy of the society. It's 160 years ago. It's like my grandfather was born, being born at that time. So it's very, it's everything is very recent, you know. So uh, I think all this is it, it, it's going to change very much. Still, it's going to change. You know, it's going to change. What well, your question was exactly? Which one? I'm sorry. What, what was your question again, Borba? About plastic. Plasticity. Oh, plasticity. Yes, the yes. Yeah, okay, the people say okay. that. Well, well, I, 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 well, I take this for granted, in the sense that I'm believing in this, because I met Dufour. I went there a few times. I did operate personally with him. Patients I took for him to operate. I joined him in surgery, and I always follow him. I'm very impressed uh, with uh, his results and what he does. I don't know how much reproducible this is, but uh, I'm, I believe in his findings. And indeed, he came back to operate patients that he could remove areas that in the first surgery he could not remove. So I believe there is some plasticity. Yes, I do believe in some plasticity. Uh, but for long-term regions, for long-term uh, long uh, lesions, not acute, they take... Uh, years, at least many months to for them to happen, for you to come back and remove the same area again, try to remove the same area again. But I, I think there is some plasticity. Yes, there is some plasticity. I thank believe you, in Thank it. you again. Believe yeah. in this. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation, as always. Huh? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My very always. good friend, Borba, our leading surgeon here in Brazil nowadays. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to both Professor, Professor Boba and uh, Professor Ribas. Uh, uh, Professor Ribas, especially a very nice, uh, amazing lecture, Professor. And uh, I think uh, we can move on to the second lecture. Uh, just for, for your information, we have about 380 uh, uh, participants uh, join us from uh, three different platforms, uh, from WeChat, uh, YouTube, and also our um, uh, channel. Uh, thank you again. Uh, uh, may I call upon uh, Professor Takagi to, to invite our second uh, speaker, Professor? Okay. Good evening, good morning, and good night, everybody. The concept of normal pleasure hydrocephalus was introduced by Hakim and Adams about 60 years ago. And hydrocephalus has been known for a long time as a pediatric brain disease that is characterized by the large head caused by the accumulation of cerebrospinal fluid in the ventricles, with extremely increased intracranial pressure. Hakim and Adams reported adult hydrocephalus with normal intracranial pressure and without enlarged circumference of the head. The adult normal pressure hydrocephalus is characterized by the three symptoms of dementia, gait disturbance, and urinary incontinence. These symptoms can be treated by cerebrospinal fluid shunt surgery. And Hakim and Adams have introduced the concept of normal pressure hydrocephalus based on only six cases in the ELA without CT scan or MRI. And the CT scan and MRI have been introduced about 10 years after they proposed the concept of NPH. And unfortunately, the correlation between the size of ventricular uh, size and the severity of the symptoms has not been fully investigated. Therefore, the diagnosis and of adult normal pressure hydrocephalus is still controversial. Therefore, the diagnosis. <clears throat> the furthermore, some neurologists uh, deny even the existence of the clinical entity of idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus. In the United States, placebo controlled trial of shunt surgery in idiopathic normal pressure hydrocephalus is now conducted by the 
Adult Hydrocephalus Clinical Research Network, AHCRN. Uh, Professor Ramesh is one of the distinguished experts of GSF Dynamics. He will inform us uh, the update knowledge about the importance of, to study the GSF Dynamics in the diagnosis and treatment of normal pressure hydrocephalus. Now listen to uh, Professor Ramesh lecture. Please start again, Professor. Uh, good, I mean, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, friends. And thank you, Dr. Takagi and Dr. Singh for introduction and give me the chance to share my views on this topic. After listening to a lecture on anatomy and surgery, now we are moving on to uh, physiology and investigation of a very common, one of the common neurosurgical problems that is normal pressure hydrocephalus. This cerebrospinal fluid uh, dynamics is a I mean, one of the less explored fields in neuroscience because I, I think many people have, I mean, uh, uh, not given importance to this. Of late, of course, uh, people like uh, I mean, Boone and Anthony Marmarau and uh, other people, uh, Katzman and others, have evinced interest in this field, extract all these people, and they have revived the interest in this field of study of cerebrospinal fluid dynamics and and uh, the, especially the it is very useful in conditions which affect the csf uh, dynamics like normal pressure hydrocephalus post meningitic hydrocephalus post traumatic hydrocephalus and also idiopathic intracranial hypertension these are the disorders of C csf uh, dynamics so this investigation of this csf dynamics will be helpful in elucidating the um, severity and uh, the type of treatment in these conditions. Uh, just I will uh, place my lecture on these subtopics. Uh, <clears throat> coming to the CSF physiology, <clears throat> as everybody knows, the CSF is formed mainly from the choroid plexuses, and 80 to 90 percent of CSF is secreted and it, uh, at the rate of about 0.3 to 0.5 ml per minute and 500 ml of CSF is secreted every day as against a total volume of CSF is 150 ml uh, which is around 3 to CSF, entire CSF is replaced about 3 times in a day and after secretion by the choroid plexus the CSF circulates through the foramen of Monroe then the third ventricle aqueduct then the fourth ventricle and then goes into the subarachnoid space and to be absorbed mainly in the superior sagittal sinus. Uh, absorption is mainly, the classically it is believed that is absorption is mainly through the arachnoidal villi along the superior sagittal sinus, dictated by the pressure gradient. This is the diagram which shows the uh, secretion choroid plexus and entering the foramen monroe, then the third ventricle aqueduct then the fourth ventricle, then into the subarachnoid space to be absorbed by the arachnoidal villi. The recent, there are uh, some recent concepts have emerged, I mean, of late, and regarding the alternate sites of CSF production. Even after choroid plexectomy, it has been observed that many CSF still is secreted. And it has been found that arachnoidal villi I mean, sorry, the ependymal surfaces of the ventricles and the arachnoidal membrane itself can secrete CSF. So that is that has been re found recently. And second is the most important thing is uh, I mean, fascinating one is the glymphatic pathway. I will talk about it little in an elaborate way. And then been also for, I mean, CSF alternate sites for CSF absorption have been found. And the ages, aging also affects these uh, various pathways. Coming to the glymphatic pathway, this is uh, perivascular, periarterial, paraarterial spaces through which the subarachnoid space communicates and the CSF gets into the paraaortic channels. Previously, we are known as Varsho Robin spaces. 
and they have been lined by the food process of the uh, uh, i mean astrocytes and they have the aquaporin 4 uh, dictated uh, channels and the csf gets into the parenchyma of the brain then the it clears the metabolites from the parenchyma then it gets back into the paravenous sinuses paravenous spaces and gets into the subarachnoid space again this is called glymphatic circulation so this is may designed to clear the excess of waste metabolites from the central nervous system and it requires normal pulsate pulsation of the arteries then the uh, aqua intact aquaporin channels aquaporin four channels and good sleep uh, because sleep can also i mean if it is obstructive apnea can of increase the intravenous pressure and uh, impede the circulation so these are the things which have come into recently Uh, by, especially by the work of uh, Wang et al., uh, who have postulated, I mean, nicely this uh, about these things. And the alternate sites of CSO absorption also have been found. That it has been long time, long time known that olfactory, uh, means along the cribriform plate, the CSO can go along the olfactory nerves. and get absorbed by the lymphatics there and also the spinal roots along the spinal roots there are lymphatics which can also absorb the csf so whenever there even if there is a uh, <clears throat> i mean correct arachnoidal villi is not functioning these uh, sites serve as uh, alternate sites of csf absorption then and, uh, of course the uh, i told about the lymphatic pathway here like uh, what i have or previously then the csf production and the absorption in aging that is a, one of the concepts i will deal when i talk about the pathogenesis of uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus uh, the classical theory for class a, normal pressure hydrocephalus is that it develops because of the defective absorption of csf by the arachnoidal villi it has been long believed be, be, uh, to be the major cause but these recent studies have concentrated on the glymphatic system and the pathogenesis of non pressure hydrocephalus the excess csf may stagnate in the dilated perivascular spaces which compresses on the penetrating arteries i mean uh, the the arteries here and so the uh, i mean the pulsatility of the arteries are gone so the pulsation to drive the csf i mean into the parenchyma is diminished then also the aquaporin for density is reduces with aging so this also causes uh, more abnormal fluid uh, accumulation in perivascular fluid flow in nph patients and sleep abnormality especially the obstructive sleep apnea can produce produce uh, increase venous hypertension venous hypertension and cause uh, take part in the pathogenesis of normal pressure hydrocephalus so these are the recent uh, concepts in the uh, pathogenesis of normal pressure hydrocephalus of course uh, as professor takagi uh, pointed out uh, the diagnosis uh, of uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus mainly is clinical supported by imaging and also so i mean this recently the csf studies have complemented the I mean uh, uh, complemented the diagnosis in doubtful cases so the classical triad of uh, gait disturbance uh, dementia and ataxy i mean uh, incontinence with gait disturbance being most predominant than the cognitive disturbance this is the clinical feature most important clinical feature of uh, nph which differentiates from other causes of dementia where dementia predominates the gait disturbance and other things and also imaging if you see if the imaging if you see the ventricular dilatation out of proportion to the <coughs> cortical atrophy and also periventricular lucency the e1 index more than 0.3 and also the t2 weighted mri you can see the flow wide the aqueduct aqueduct flow wide is an important sign and these are the radiological features which suggest 
that it could be normal pressure hydrocephalus and also of late now the csf gated uh, studies using phase contrast mri and measuring the acute stroke volume uh, and elevate mean peak flow velocity acquired across the aqueduct uh, uh, have been used in the diagnosis of uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus uh, aqueduct uh, stroke volume more than 42 microliters and elevated peak flow velocity are diagnostic of <clears throat> normal pressure hydrocephalus then why why you want uh, csf uh, studies um, in the diagnosis many times patients may have a combination of uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus and also other causes of uh, dementia like vascular diseases or alzheimers so we have to know whether it is a disease i mean patient symptoms are really due to the normal pressure hydrocephalus or because of uh, other causes and also whether the shunt will help these candidates uh, so for these these uh, csf studies are of importance uh, the commonly used uh, have been, uh, studies have been intracranial pressure monitoring external lumbar drainage csf tap test and also the csf dynamics like the uh, outflow resistance measurement which we call as out uh, measurement so i will consider one by one all this intracranial pressure monitoring has been used for, uh, of late for diagnosis of uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus overnight recording of intracranial pressure uh, I mean if it is more than 17.6 between it is not normal it is between 4.4 and 7.56 to suggest a nph and continuous icp monitoring may if they shows a waves lundberg a waves or b waves more than 20% of the record are diagnostic of normal pressure hydrocephalus but icp monitoring is not no no is of no value predicting the shunt responsiveness it is and more it is more invasive procedure and it requires a certain equipment to do that and uh, you have to hospitalize the patient to diagnose this and the other one is the external lumbar drainage where you place the lumbar catheter intrathecal lumbar catheter and control drainage of cs of 10 ml per hour for about uh, 48 to 72 hours and look for the improvement in gait and also neuropsychological improvement uh, it shows better predictive value than the other tests but patient requires hospitalization and it is more invasive procedure and high has more incidence of complications and so it is not very popular so many people still do it then coming to the tap test where you remove between 30 to do a lumbar puncture and remove about 30 to 50 ml of csf and assess for improvement in the gait some people use this neurological neuropsychological i mean evaluation before and after the tap it is simple to perform and it has got good diagnostic test specificity is about 33% and sensitivity is about 62% in predicting shunt responsiveness so it is still uh, i mean not fully sensitive but it can be very useful in diagnosis of a normal pressure hydrocephalus and it is a very simple test to be done i mean on the bedside itself you can do it then coming to the uh, csf dynamics studies the uh, out measurement of csf outflow resistance which we call as r out uh, uh, gaining importance in the diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus and also prediction of shunt responsiveness this is a very important aspect because as i told you it can i mean uh, nph can mimic other things and also there can be a combination of uh, nph with other diseases so we have to know whether the, it is a nph and whether it there in a case of combination whether the patient will respond to shunt or not so in this aspect uh, r out measurement is very useful there are various methods of measurement of the csf outflow resistance one is the method advocated by katzman which is a constant flow infusion method second is the one which is uh, advocated by anthony marmaro uh this is the bolus lumbar bolus lumbar injection method and i have a little modified this uh, improvised this method and i have called it uh, madras institute of neurology that is mim what i call mim method 
I will give the details later. In the Katzman's uh, method, uh, the pump introduces saline at a constant rate uh, through the needle placed in the lumbar subarachnoid space. And the, till a steady state is achieved. So the R out is the difference between the final steady state pressure reach and the initial pressure and divided by the infusion rate. So, but it takes quite some time, nearly a few hours to reach the steady state and requires a special laboratory setup. So mainly it is used in investigative, I mean, uh, lab as a lab investigative method and not widely used as a clinical, in the clinical setting. Whereas, uh, bolus lumbar injection method as devised by uh, Professor Marmarov, uh, it involves injection of a small quantity of uh, I mean, saline to the lumbar subarachnoid space and uh, R out is calculated by using a little complex uh, two-step formula. But it is really less time consuming and also measures the CSO, I mean, compliance of the brain by measuring the pressure volume index. So it's a very simple method and as I will tell you, the modification which I have made on this Marmaro's technique. This is the Institute of Neurology, Madras Institute of Neurology, which was started by Professor Red B, Professor B. Ram Murthy, where I have worked nearly for three decades before joining the present institution. And this is the place where I did most of my work on this CSF dynamics. Uh, this is an improved uh, method, improvised method of uh, bolus lumbar injection method, and it can be done on the bedside with uh, readily easily available material. It can even be done in a, a smaller hospitals also, and it can be done within a few minutes. And no expensive material or equipment or lab setup are required. Uh, these are the things which are needed. For this, if you do, if you have a manometer, it's okay. If you don't have manometer, you can use a, a intravenous uh, so in I mean, tube as a monitor with the alarm attached with the attached with the measuring tape by the side, and uh, can use the this is a spinal needle and the three-way adapter. And for calculation, you need this uh, logarithm table. Nowadays. We use the calculators and also you, which are available even in, even in the mobile phone. So this is a, these are the equipment which may be used for this measurement. It's a very simple method. And this is a setting when the patient is in the, on his side and his lumbar puncture is made, three-way adapter and you have the manometer by the side. And you can measure the pressure from the manometer. Um, a saline manometer is uh, made up by setting, uh, as I told you, if it is not readily available, you can use an intravenous set mounted on a meter scale with a zero level corresponding to the level of the spine. Make a lumbar puncture with a 20 gauge spinal needle and connect the to the saline manometer through a three-way adapter. The CSF column will stabilize at a particular level and it is taken as the opening pressure. Then you inject a Known volume of saline, usually 5 to 10 ml into the subarachnoid space through a three way power port at the rate of 1 ml per second. And the peak pressure is reached after the injection and it is noted. Once the CS, CSF <coughs> column starts uh, falling gradually, and after a fixed time, say 5 minutes or 10 minutes, can read, uh, take the pressure again. It is noted as PT and it involves a uh, a simple calculation, uh, two-step formula, uh, which is devised by Professor Marmarov. And the pressure, first step is to measure the measure the pressure volume index. And second step is to measure the uh, uh, R out value, and which gives in centimeters of water per minute, uh, which is converted into <coughs> millimeters of mercury by dividing by 1.36. is measured as millimeters of mercury per ml per minute. That is the unit we use for expressing the outflow resistance. So in a small study, I mean, which have been, we have published in the journal, uh, but we are doing this as a routine nowadays and in the Institute of Madras Institute of Neurology and also in the place where I work. Uh, 
this method is being routinely used in the diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus. The small study we have uh, published, we have had 19 patients in normal pressure hydrocephalus, where we have taken a CS, I mean, eight, value about 18 millimeters of mercury per ml per minute, and uh, as a diagnostic of uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus and the shunt responsiveness for NPH. And prediction of shunt responsiveness for, uh, by R out was <coughs> nearly 90%. Correct. Uh, why we have chosen 18 millimeters is, it is by the, <coughs> the in Holland study by Boone et al. We have, who have concluded that 18 is the value where, above which it is more than 90% of accuracy in predict, predicting shunt responsiveness. So hence we took that same value as a 18, 18 millimeters of mercury as a cut, cut off. Now, however, normal, normally the uh, R out is in normal patients is only less than nine, nine millimeters of mercury per ml per minute. And it is, if it is more than 18, it is diagnostic of hydrocephalus, I mean normal pressure hydrocephalus okay, because of severe outflow resistance and the shunt responsiveness is good. Even if the patient uh, MRI may show a little more atrophy and uh, other features may not fit in with the normal pressure hydrocephalus. So this can be used when, whenever you have a dilemma in the diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus. And it's a very useful and simple method uh, for prediction of uh, shunt responsiveness. I'll just show you a case example where there was a 45-year-old man who presented with gait ataxia and memory disturbance since eight months. The neurological examination showed that he had, had, had a moderate degree of cognitive impairment with memory deficits and he had a slow ataxic gait. The CT scan brain shows a I mean, uh, moderate degree of cortical atrophy and also ventricular megaly, where the diagnosis still could have been I mean, equivocal. Uh, so we did a CSF dynamics by the above method and uh, outflow resist opening pressure was 17 millimeters of centimeters of water and uh, outflow resistance was 22 millimeters of mercury per ml per minute by the Metras Institute of Neurology bolus injection method. So we made the diagnosis of normal pressure, confirmed the diagnosis of normal pressure and VP shunt was done and patient symptoms, cognitive symptoms and gait improved remarkably. <coughs> so whenever uh, you suspect a uh, Normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, do uh, I mean can directly do the, the bolus lumbar infusion test, or tap, or you can do a tap test. Sometimes in the tap test, the opening pressure may may not be very high, and uh, symptoms I mean improvement also may be equivocal. So in those cases, we again do the infusion test. So this is the gives yields a, a very high sensitivity accuracy ranging from 57 to 100 and is associated uh, with, uh, I mean, uh, specificity of 90, 75 to 92 percent. And it can be done as an, even as an outpatient clinic procedure. And the 50 to 100 percent sensitivity and the positive predictive value is associated with the lumbar drain, external drainage, but, but patient, the patient requires hospitalization and it has its own side effects. And the improvement is... So, <coughs> Improvement of symptoms is seen after the drainage is stopped. These have been the conclusions of other studies. So if you see that this is the approach for a patient with a normal pressure hydrocephalus, where we do a clinical examination, see the triad, and if E1 index is more than 0.3, then evaluate for the surgical candidacy. Do a lumbar puncture, bolus injection method, do a CSF dynamics test for a uh, outflow resistance increased to a shunt. This, <clears throat> or you can do a, just a opening pressure measurement. If it is high, you can do straight away to a tap test and then proceed with the shunt. So this is the flow diagram showing that approach. So to conclude, the understanding of CSF physiology has undergone a sea change with the discovery of lymphatic system. The concepts on pathogenesis and pathophysiology of normal pressure hydrocephalus are also changing 
the view of this uh, newly found out lymphatic system. The diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus is mostly on clinical and imaging findings complemented by the CSF flow studies. CSF studies are good adjunct to the diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus in predicting the diagnosis and prediction of response to shunt. And the CSF opening pressure measurement, R out measurement, and tap test are all very good tools. ICP monitoring and external lumbar drainage have their own limitations. Uh, R out predicts the shunt responsiveness more accurately. And the Madras Institute of Neurology method of R out measurement is a very simple bedside tool for the measurement of R out. I thank you for your uh, patient hearing and uh, I kept my I mean, lecture a little shorter because of uh, shortage of time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Ramesh. Uh, I'm very much interested in your lecture. Uh, you showed uh, four methods to diagnose NPH uh, infusion test, tap test, and external drainage and uh, ICP monitoring. Uh, which is the best method to diagnose, or uh, you perform all four methods for one no, patient? I do. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Doctor Nakagi. I mean, uh, I do only the bolus lumbar infusion method. Mm. Uh, I do the TAP test also as a complementary test, mm. uh, but I never have done uh, external lumbar drainage or ICP monitoring uh, for diagnosis because of their own limitations. Uh, the uh, bolus injection test uh, is uh, uh, very familiar in India? Uh, not widely familiar. In my place, yes, of course, after I started it, uh -huh. people have started using many neurologists and neurosurgeons. I've started using in my place, that is uh -huh. Madras, Chennai. Uh, many people are doing it. The uh, infusion test is really popular in Europe and in England, but yeah. in Japan it is not so popular. We just uh, perform a lumbar tap test, uh, but uh, the sensitivity is very high. So about uh, 10,000 people are uh, receiving uh, a shunt surgery, and the result is very good. Uh, well. In your institute, how many patients receive the shunt surgery in a year? I mean, uh, maybe the, for normal pressure hydrocephalus, you mean? Mm. For normal pressure hydrocephalus, maybe about 20 to 30 patients every year. Mm. Thank you. Uh, uh, from the audience, are there any questions? Uh, uh, there, there's no question in the chat box, uh, but I have a oh. two questions for you, Professor. Uh, professor, I want, want to find out from you, would the uh, TAP test affect the reliability of your dynamic uh, CSF study or you wait for a time, sometime, one week later or so ever uh, for the accuracy in your CSF dynamic for those who you have performed a TAP test earlier? My second question, Professor, uh, do you experience over time the shunt response getting worse? I mean, the shunt response has reduced over years. And do you have a chance to do a CSF dynamic test in those patients, uh, whether uh, the, the, the reading appear back to the same level that you have experienced before? Thank you, Professor. What was your first question? I didn't get your first question. Yeah, whether the TAP test affect the, the study on CSF dynamic, do you wait right. for some time for it to normalize? So what I do is I do both at the same time. See, I do the CSF dynamics first. And uh, let out the CSF at, at the end of the uh, CSF, I mean, uh, bolus lumbar injection test. After that, I do the tap test in addition. So both actually are complementary to each other. And I have found that, uh, I mean, shunt predictiveness of shunt responsiveness is very good. Uh, so regarding your second question, I have not had an occasion to study in patients who have shunt, been shunted and then become less responsive to treatment. I have not uh, had uh, an experience to do that. Thank, thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Ribas, do you have any question for Professor Ramesh? You may. Yes, please. Uh, Ramesh, congratulations for your, all your work and contributions in this uh, strange and, 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 and field that it's growing indeed. 
we see more and more of these patients. Uh, I don't know if it's your experience also, but we have some patients that do very well to start with. You put the shunt and they have a very nice response. And then after a couple of years of very variable this, they became worse again. And uh, I, I always say the patients that uh, the, the shunt is always a try. We, we're never sure about what's going to happen. And now I always say that in, in, in a few years, it, it, it might not work anymore. And do you have any thoughts about this? And what do you do in these cases if you have these cases? Uh, one of the, I mean, just we have to see whether the shunt is malfunctioning. That is, or we have to increase the, I mean, the, I mean, lower the opening pressure of the valve. Uh, whether you can downgrade the opening pressure of the valve, see, I mean, of the shunt. Uh, these are things we can we try usually. And if you use a programmable valve, can reduce the uh, opening pressure and see if it works. It's only by trial and uh, this thing. But sometimes if the vascular element, uh, I mean, like the patient develops the cerebrovascular insufficiency in addition, that may cause worsening also because of the age. They may develop uh, coexisting Alzheimer's or uh, because of the vascular dementia, patient may become worse also. That also we have to keep in mind in evaluating these patients. In your, in your cases, uh... Most of patients that you open the valve, most of most most of these patients get better, or most of these patients do not get better anymore when they get worse uh, and you open the valve. Yeah, so some patients do improve, but uh, nearly fifty percent. I mean, as you say, they worsen in spite of uh, your uh, good functioning. I mean, shunt functioning. As you say, I mean, maybe due to some other vascular problem or uh, Alzheimer's disease pre-existing also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, 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 Professor Ramesh. Uh, Professor Thank Riba, you. I have one question. Uh, sorry, I just interrupt. Uh, Professor Riba, I have one question for you. Uh, between transalcus and transcortical, how to decide for anatomy, Professor Riba? Transalcus or transcortical? For intra-axial tumor, when you work in a very eloquent area, and you want to just do a debulking of the tumor, you don't need to go transocal. You can just debulk the tumor and use the soci as uh, as landmarks. Uh, the problem open the soci is the uh, are the arteries down there and the veins that might bleed. So I, I try to avoid this in, in more eloquent areas doing this because I try to avoid damaging vessels, of course. So what I do very frequently is that I start opening the soci and then I go supio uh, in this more dangerous areas. Now, if, if, you have, if you have nice soci, for example, the superior frontal sucus, when you have superior gyros uh, tumors and SMA tumors, I think it's very good to open because it's easy to open and nice to open, you know. But it depends on the difficulties you find. But I try to avoid this in eloquent areas. Thank you, Professor. So it's very, we have very good uh, session today with uh, Prof, uh, Professor Riba <laughs> and Professor yes. Ramesh. Thank you very much. Are you any question, uh, Taha? Thank you very much for this lecture. Uh, I want just to, to, to add uh, the, uh, the study of uh, the Swedish uh, uh, Society uh, uh, of Neurosurgery. Uh, in in, in uh, Sweden, uh, the, the, there is a, 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 they have many, many uh, um, cases of uh, hydrocephalus uh, in uh, uh, adults. And they, uh, uh, with the long term, uh, uh, either uh, when we talk about the fire of the uh, the, the the derivation or the the, the shunt, uh, they uh, found that there there is uh, uh, an, uh, 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 in French amelioration. It's uh, uh, with the long time. We have uh, um, uh, some uh, 
a regulation of symptom of uh, hydros, uh, under hydrocephalus. And now, the, uh, the, when the neurosurgeon uh, meets a patient with hydrocephalus, he has three months to put the uh, derivation. I don't know, Doc, if uh, you understand me. Yeah. Yes. Because I mean, uh, uh, what uh, was the Yes. No, not just uh, 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 I add some information about uh, uh, when we talk about fire, uh, we, uh, the, the study, the uh, Swedish study uh, uh, demonstrated that de with, with a long time, there are amelioration of symptoms. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we, we may hear the concluding uh, remark from Professor Takagi. Professor? Oh, thank you very much. It is a very, very important session <laughs> because uh, hydrocephalus is now a uh, very complicated situation in the Europe and the America. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Thank you. Good, good, good night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for Professor Takagi and uh, Professor Ramesh. So we're going to end our session today. On behalf of Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yokokato, I would like to thank both speakers of today, Professor Ribas and Professor Ramesh, as well as our Chair, Professor Luis Boba and Professor Kiyoshi Takagi for the time and support for the ACNS webinar. I also would like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Zubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. And today we have around 380 uh, people who join us live. So until we meet again online on 10th of December, it's bye-bye from all of us. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Professor. Good night.